Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Game Changers, a podcast where you learn about all of your favorite analysts in the fantasy and sports industry, just about how they got their started, how they got their start. Uh, I'm Dan Harris. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Harris 80. Uh, a few weeks ago, the fantasy football community was entirely united. Everybody was doing almost the exact same thing, and that was checking their email <laughs> to see whether or not they got an invite uh, into Scott Fishbowl. 10. It is the largest collection of analysts and fans. It brings everybody together. It raises an incredible amount for charity. It brings fantasy football Twitter together. And today, it is really my pleasure to welcome the creator of the Scott Fishbowl, Scott Fish himself. He is one of the most charitable individuals, one of the nicest guys, and a dynamite fantasy football analyst. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dan. Thanks for having me on. This is uh, This is wonderful. <laughs> No, no. I mean, look, it's a great time. Obviously, everybody's excited. I'm going to be honest with you. I've been in the fishbowl, I think, for four years. I was in the finals one mm -hmm. year and came yep. real close. If I if I had just started CJ Anderson, I think in that final week, I think I actually might have been able to take it home. Oh. But I remember this week, this year, for whatever reason, my invite came relatively late and yeah. I almost resigned myself to oh. not getting in. And it was funny. It was just the feeling of being so sad and not, not again. I mean, you, so many people, I mean, how many, how many people apply to get into this? To uh, I think it's uh, closing in on 11,000 now, I believe 10,000 something. <laughs> oh my God. And how many yeah. people actually get in? Uh, this year, 1,440. Man, so I, I mean, I increased it again just cause I feel bad. I feel bad that so many people can't get in. What's the most stressful time, out of curiosity, for you in the entire thing? Is it draft day when some people aren't showing up and you get, you know, emails from people in leagues? Or is it just the sorting it out in the beginning? It's uh, it's when I fall behind. <laughs> it's <laughs> the sorting it out in the beginning is not tough. It's it's about this time when I when I know that I'm a little bit behind. Draft day is actually not that bad. The last last year. I think people are so excited for Fishbowl now that I, we know we really don't have the problem with people not showing up anymore. Uh, I think we had to replace one or two people last year, and it used to be like 10, 12, 15 people. Now people show up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It dominates everybody in early July. If you are into fantasy football, it's going to dominate your Twitter feed for a little while Yeah, because it's great. It's, it's just a wonderful, in addition to the fact that it raises so much money for charity, which is fantastic. It, it's really just a great way to bring fans and analysts together and for just, you know, to kind of, you know, everybody to, to be as one. It's a great community that we work in. So uh, it's really, it's one of my favorite things. I'm excited for it. I'm already parsing through the scoring settings and yeah. trying to tweak my rankings because it's a unique animal. That's so, for sure. Sorry about your invite too. Is I did tags tell you I, I talked to him about that? No. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 every year people try to sign up under, you know, various sites and claim that they, uh, you know, claim they write places that they don't sometimes. And I, I go to verify with people, Hey, I, you know, is this guy actually a writer for you or are they just trying to fake it to have a better chance of getting in? And I went to tags, you know, like I normally do. And he mentioned you and I'm like, no, he, he was invited. What? <laughs> like I, I was like, no, Dan's a mainstay. He's in every year. I, I was actually a little surprised that it, I didn't send that right away. I, I, uh -oh. felt, I felt bad. <laughs> Oh, well, now I owe tags. No, it's not. And of course, God, I mean, if I hadn't been invited, it would have been fine. I did ask the rest of the guys. I was like, hey, you know, just wondering, blah, blah. blah. And I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have reached out to you or anything like that. You have a million people trying to get in. If for whatever reason I wasn't invited, it would have been fine. But great. Now I owe tags like a beer or something for reaching out to you about <laughs> it. But he's going to hold that over my head. Uh, but that's great. Yeah, I'm excited about it. We all are. So I can't wait to get going. But obviously today is not just about the fishbowl. It's, it's about learning about you and how you got your start and how you got into this. So we'll get into all of that in one second. I want to remind everybody before we get going that there are five days left in our contest to win a signed Devontae Adams helmet. All you need to do to be entered is to leave a review for the podcast on either Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Send a screenshot of that review to GameChangers at FantasyPros.com. That is it. That gets you an automatic entry. And I will remind everybody, as I always do, this is a new podcast. I believe Scott is our seventh guest. So there aren't a crazy amount of entrants. There's only a few days left in this podcast. Get your review in, whatever it is, an honest review, and just send it in again to GameChangers at FantasyPros.com. 
All right, Scott, let's get started with you. And I actually want to ask you a a specific question. Usually I ask, you know, oh, you know, did you always think you'd work in sports? But I want to ask you a question because I have a theory about it. Um, Your Twitter profile name is ScottFish24, right? Yeah. I assume you're not the best looking person ever to have been born in 1924. (laughs) Uh, And I assume you were older than 24 when Twitter first came out. So is is 24 significant in sports in any way or is it it just a random number? It is. I've tweeted about this before. It's, uh, It's Ken Griffey Jr. He was my favorite player growing up, and uh, uh, yeah, so that that I put twenty four on everything after after he came into the league. He came into the league probably when I was about ten or eleven. So, and uh, was he just your favorite because he was amazing, or were you a? Are you from? You live in Minnesota, right? I live are in Minnesota, f- and uh, but I was I was definitely a Twins fan and a a Mariners fan back then. I I had Mariners hats and stuff like that because I was such a big Ken Griffey Jr. fan. Um, it was a good time for me having Ken Griffey Jr. and Kirby Puckett as my yeah. as my two my two uh, loves in baseball. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. I was wondering about that because I I was I mean mine is eighty. I I won't you know my my Twitter handle is Dan Harris eighty. I won't you know blow any doors. I'm that's the year I was born. So you know you could <laughs> you could get my year. But uh, yeah. All right. Good. I, I figured that. All right. So now let's move into you know were you always a, a giant football fan sort of growing up is it something i mean you talk about baseball were you more baseball than football when you first started growing up no i was i was always more football even during the the twin the twins won two world series when i was when i was young so you'd think i i would be hugely uh affected by that and into baseball and i i did love baseball for a long time and i i loved all sports until just around the end of college at that point it just it became all football for me but i always loved football the most it was yeah. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, it's just the Vikings were my passion forever. Yes. Yeah. All right. So uh, was it your thought or your goal that one day you would essentially be covering, you know, forget about fantasy for the moment, just generally, like, did you want to work in some capacity doing football related stuff? Or was it just like, I'm a sports fan. I love football and I'm going to have my career and do whatever I'm going to do. No, no, actually it it just came pretty organically, honestly. Uh I think when I was younger I had visions of being a teacher like my parents uh or a writer cuz I loved writing, uh which, you know, plays in later <laughs> with the fantasy sure. stuff. Uh but then I started managing a video store when I was 18 and I thought eh, this could be my life and uh I'm glad I didn't keep down that road. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's yeah, true. You yeah. could have been the the lone blockbuster guy, right? Yeah. That that one store that's still around. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, no, I I honestly didn't think it, it would be this would end up being my career. But I I just kept plugging away doing doing it online, and eventually it did become my career. It's you know my full time gig now. Okay, so before we got there, so you you know what what was your career path other than the video store uh, before you wound up getting into this full time? So what were you doing, and and then we'll get into when you started doing this at all, like on a on more of a than just a playing level. But what were you doing as career wise before you really got into working in the fantasy football industry? Sure. Well, I went to college for management and finance. Uh, I I did the the managing a video store, and then I was a personal director at a Renaissance festival and. Uh, you know, then I, I just, I got to the point where <laughs> weird considering what I do now, especially with SFB, but I got to the point, I just didn't love being managing that many people, like hundreds of people, like dealing with all that stuff. <laughs> and so <laughs> well, that, that's, a, yeah, that's a little weird considering know. you manage the largest fantasy football league in the world. I know. And my, you know, my real job, my real job is running a thousand you know, fantasy leagues right. with 10,000 to use. Right. But anyway, I, uh, I went into, I got out of all of it and I got a manual labor job and just, uh, I was working for Pepsi, just throwing cases. And, uh, you know, I, it, it was nice to stay in decent shape all the time from that, but sure. there was no thinking involved. I would work for three and a half days a week, be off three and a half days a week. I like, once I was off work, I didn't even think about my job. It was just simple and easy, hard work, but it, you know, mentally easy. And I, I love that. I was on that career path for, it was a 30 and out, um, that company. And I was 14 years, 15 years in. And when I got, uh, the full time fantasy, uh, opportunity, it was a tough choice, but I, I made it and I, I have no regrets for making that jump, even though, uh, I, I did kind of enjoy being able to, uh, do something simple and mindless. And, and, you know, I, I, I like to work hard and, and it was hard work. It was fun. 
So before we get there, before we get into full time, I mean, you didn't jump from being just a, you know, somebody doing manual labor to being like, hey, look at me, I'm gaining a, a full time fantasy position. You started writing on the side while you were doing yeah. that or before or what? Yeah. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, I, I was doing these things, these leagues that had college players. Um, and so this is before that anybody had ever heard of Debbie really. And, right. uh, so I went on message boards and forums and, and AOL chats and stuff, chat, you know, group chats or whatever. You're not the first chat person, rooms. by the way, who has been on this, who talks about the fact that they're just in chat rooms and stuff like that. And that's how they get their start. They yeah. just start talking about it in there. Yeah. You look for people who are doing the same thing or want to have the same interest as you. And, um, that led to, you know, a message board form, whatever that, uh, you know, I found myself on that one more and more. And then that site decided, you know, they said, Hey, could you do our start sit and our waivers? And I, I did. And then a year or two after that, I started my own website doing that and more. And, uh, it just kind of grew from there. Um, that's, that's the way it, it just, it just kind of organically happened. I, I had a passion for writing and I, and for doing fantasy football stuff and small steps along the way got here. All right. So tell me about the site that you started. Was that, is that fantasy football Oasis? Is that what that one was? That was the one I started. Yep. That was the one I I, I believe I started in about 06 or 07. And I did that for six or seven years. Um, But then I went to, you know, I closed it down. I went to dynasty league football for a year or two. Um, I ended up doing a lot more behind the scenes than in front of the scenes. Uh, A lot of people don't realize this about me, but I have, built a lot of websites for people around the industry. Um, and I've, I've, uh, I've hosted a lot of podcasts around the industry and still do probably over 10 of them. And, uh, I've been coding since I was 15. So, um, I've done a lot of behind the scenes stuff and that's what I ended up doing with DLF. I did a bunch of behind the scenes stuff and a lot less writing. And, uh, you know, in 2004, 16 or so i i got that full-time opportunity and i or 17 and i took it so how did that come about out of curiosity because i mean i i'll be honest with you i have been working in the industry full-time for five months i started okay. in february i was part-time with fancy pros i was a lawyer so i was just doing it on the side and writing and enjoying it and everything like that and it just kind of grew from there so i'm wondering how did you get from you know you're, you're doing a lot you start your own website that's pretty amazing and then you get to the point where you're offered a full-time position and you take it. So how do you get from point A to point B? Like, tell me about that process. Uh, I think part of it was that I'm in Minnesota and Minnesota is kind of a hub for, for fantasy analysts. And there, there are guys like, you know, uh, Rob Pythian and uh, Paul Charchin and stuff mm-hmm. here. And, and I ended up going to work for, for their new company. Um, I think a big, a big thing that really helped along the way is I just, I had, I had a versatile set. Like I could, uh, I could write and I could code and, uh, I could commission leagues and I could, there's a, there's a lot of things within the industry that I could do, um, I think really helped my case. And I I think what made me stand out for many years is that I, I pushed this Devi thing that this developmental players thing that nobody was doing at the time. And, um, it kind of got me on the map and FF Oasis, when it started, it was, like if you Google searched PPR or you Google searched IDP, we were the first page every time because that was our focus. And in 2007, that both of those things were – they existed. Well, it's not like we invented them. They existed, but we sure. were we were on the forefront of this is the only thing we're going to talk about. <laughs> and so people looking for those two things came to, came to us. So I think finding a niche that, that – uh, in the industry really helped help me stand out a little and being in Minnesota, they were looking for someone local. And uh, that was me. I, I jumped to the top of their list. So interesting. I, I want to ask usually how, you know, once I get to the end of someone's journey, I ask, what's the one piece of advice that you would offer somebody who's starting? Obviously, when you start out, things were, were different, of course, because, you know, you first really started, you know, writing or whatever it is back in the mid 2000s or whatever it was. Yeah, even what, early. What yeah. piece of advice would you offer somebody now starting to get? I'm wondering whether or not you, you mentioned versatility. Is it to try to be versatile or what would you offer advice to somebody who's like, hey, Scott, I want to get started. I want to eventually work full time in the fantasy industry. Well, I think versatility is hugely important nowadays. And I, I think 
Uh, I mean, and and it it doesn't have to be coding like I was or running leagues like I. I mean, it can be just versatility. You know, being good with video graphics, or it can be good with uh, writing and YouTube or podcasting. Like being able to do multiple of those things, multiple different media formats is is really seems to be more and more important nowadays. Um, yeah, that's 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 a really good one to <laughs> to yeah. always be. But I I think the biggest tip I would ever give anyone nowadays is to just be completely authentically yourself. I think people can nowadays tell if you're, if you're faking it or whatever, like if you don't have a take on something, be honest, you don't have a take on something. <laughs> or if you, or if, if, you know, don't, don't try to be what you think your listener or reader wants you to be, just be yourself and it's going to come across and it makes you more, I guess, trustworthy, but also just more relatable. Um, yeah. I, I think those would be two big things that I, I would preach to people. So I really just want to echo both of those things. First of all, authenticity is a theme that almost everybody who has been successful in this industry sort of hammers down, right? You yeah. are who you are. Don't try to be some of you're not. And I completely agree because I like to joke that I'm like the cold takes hero because <laughs> I, I'm very rarely spicy. Like I'm very rarely like, no, no, this guy who everybody thinks is, you know, the, the RB25, I have him as the RB4. Like I'm, I'm rarely that guy. Yeah. I don't think you have to be. I don't think you need to pretend to be necessarily to do that. But the versatility point, Scott, and I, I just want to hammer it home because because you are the first person to really, really hammer that home. And, you know, I'm I'm talking about it. it. It helped in this industry as well. But back when I was a lawyer, I worked at like the corporate law firms. One of the reasons I was successful is because I could do certain things that really aren't part of my job description. Yeah. I knew how to place a conference call, right? Like the, our, our assistants, our administrative assistants were the ones who always did that. But when it was after hours and they didn't know how to do it or somebody was gone, I could just do that. That adds value to what you're doing. I learned how to file things myself as opposed to going to the clerk's office. That adds value. Things that you can do, the more things you can do, even if it's not a direct part necessarily of what you expect to be doing in this industry, it adds value yep. to you as an employee and something like that. So I think it's great. And you obviously, I had no idea even, Scott, that you had a background in coding whatsoever, yeah. which is hugely important. Um, so that, that part of it, I think is great. Cause I really think that's the first time that anybody's come on and really been like, well, I could do X, I could do Y, I could do Z. And that is really something that adds to your value when you're looking at a full-time role. Absolutely. And I, I think if you're going to a big company, they're probably hiring you for a role, but it also helps the company save some costs if you're able to do other things and they're going to be a, not just appreciative, but it's going to make you more valuable to them. And if you're going to a startup, or a small company, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats anyway. So yep. e on either one of those fronts, being versatile is extremely helpful. There is no downside to it whatsoever yeah. to, to basically be like, well, this isn't really part of my job, but you know what? I want to learn how to do that so yeah. that I can provide value big or small. I think it definitely comes into play. Yep. All right. We're going to get into what I call the blitz in a minute, which is 10 questions just about you, just so people can learn a little bit about you. But before I do, I mean, talk a little bit about it, just in case somebody listening to this doesn't know necessarily what the Scott Fishbowl is or, or hasn't heard of Fantasy Cares or anything like that. Right. Just give a little background on that and then we'll go and have some fun. So the Fishbowl started out as a reader league, listener league for the FF Oasis site I ran and I called it FFOI. So Fantasy Football Oasis Invitational uh, for the first two years, maybe even the third year. I'm not sure. Um and after I closed the doors on that, I realized needed a new name, went to Twitter, said, what do you guys think? And the overwhelming response was fishbowl. And of course, fishbowl.com, fishbowl.org, fishbowl, everything was taken, but Scott Fishbowl wasn't. And that's how the name came. Got it. <laughs> but but uh, um, anyway, it's basically just a giant tournament of uh, analysts and fans getting together to uh you know to play in a fantasy league together in the early years i mean that was the original of it is to get my readers and listeners to uh to play with guy like mike clay won the first year like get, get them to play with big name analysts that you know i had made friends with in the industry bring them in um and year over year it just steamrolled this analyst plays okay this one wants to play because this one is and this one right. and it just came kind of steamrolled into this giant event but what it's really about is is a giant community event where we get to can 
get to know other sites and podcasts and people that we didn't know before and we can network with them and, and, and maybe the fans that get involved they're they're such hardcore fans that maybe they become we've had we had one guy that got invited to SFB8 just as a fan just a normal guy just a huge fan and he just got uh, a full-time gig at PFF I believe for, awesome. <laughs> because because he just became a part of this industry after after you know coming into SFB. It's just this huge networking community event where we get together for a good cause and support each other. And you, you mentioned fantasy cares basically every year for the past five years or so we have raised, uh, done raised some money to buy toys at Christmas time for kids, uh, in various areas all over the country. We have analysts go shop and buy those toys. Um, and, and it comes from something I've preached for, almost a decade on radio and on podcasts. And it's, it's one of those signs you go back to, to making your way in this industry. If if you want to make something big, don't be afraid to push it at every turn. And you go on a show like yours, Dan, right here, and you're able to do it. You can take one minute, one minute and say what I said for a decade on every single show I went on, take one entry fee from your league and give it to charity. Just yep. one entry fee. You won't miss it. You're legal. Do something positive. It matters. And I just kept pushing that for long enough that now charity has become a very real, very big thing in this industry. And I'm I'm extremely happy and proud of that. And SFB is like the culmination, culmination big main event of that, of that focus of, of trying to get our industry to realize we're a giant industry that can do a ton of good if everybody just you know, chips in a little, whether it be time or money or effort or even just words on a show or in an article, uh, just every little bit helps to to push that home. Uh, it's such a great point. And, it, you know, I admire you so much because, yeah, you're right. You really I mean, even if you wouldn't come out in a minute, like you are really the reason that the industry has evolved into something that cares so much about charity. It really is because it started with you. And it's it's just a wonderful cause. The Scott Fishbowl is extremely fun and we all love it, but it really is so great because it raises so much for charity. I'm going to just echo one point that you made about the fact that if you are a fan and you're out there and you want to get into this, I believe my first year uh, in the competition, I was in a league with somebody and I remember his Twitter handle was Fantasy Football Jedi, I believe, but he didn't write for any site. He was a fan. And now I can't remember what site he writes for, but it's Russ Prentice. And he oh, sure. he was the hockey writer of the year for the FSWA or something <laughs> like two years ago or something, you know, and I don't think he wrote for a site at the time, you know, I don't think this he did either. four yeah. years ago. So, yeah, that's exactly it's actually a great jumping off point. You know what I mean? And I do. I, I fo still follow everybody who was in that first year in my <laughs> league that first year and the next year. So it's a great team building thing. So it is a great thing. I hope everybody in early July follows it. It's it's going to dominate your Twitter feed for a little while. So in case you don't know what it is, this is what it is. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, Scott. We end on something called the Blitz. It's 10 questions. Uh, I, I give you correct or incorrect answers, um, even though they're personal questions about yourself. <laughs> but I need to retain some control uh, over it. Uh, All right. So let's get started with the Blitz. Uh, you have a seven-year-old son. Is that right? Yep. OK, I do, too. Um, we do movie nights. So sure. like once a week, they get to watch a movie in front of the TV, him and his big sister, and they get to choose it. What is uh, the best movie for me to choose to watch with my seven-year-old son? <gasps> if I could choose one. Wow. Uh, it's tough, right? Well, what's been your favorite? You watch movies, I assume, with the kids. Do you watch The Avenger? Is that yeah. Are you like the Marvel movies already at this point? Yeah, that's we just, start, we just uh, finished that. We just went through those 22. His favorite movie is probably Endgame. Uh, he, yeah. he absolutely loves it, but more than movies, he loves game shows. Like he loves game shows so much. It's, it's, it's weird to see how giddy he gets at the end of episode to see who wins and who gets eliminated. Okay. What's his I, favorite game show out of curiosity? Uh, it was Lego masters. Now it's Holy moly. I guess it's just whatever's, you know, on <laughs> really. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah. That's awesome. All right. So you're basically saying skip the movie, watch a game show. Is that really what it I, is? Well, for my son, I prefer to watch the game show just because he gets crazy excited. He lo 
and maybe this comes from me with fantasy football or something, but he loves watching, you know, people do good and people do bad and people succeed and people get eliminated and like people make the finale and he just like, uh, you know, the progression of it. He just loves that. All right. I'll mark that as a correct answer because it's unique. I will say that I'm nervous about watching any of the Marvel movies with my son because legitimately we've gone to like the 80s movies from when uh-huh. I was a kid. So we were watching Short Circuit and Short Circuit 2. And in Short Circuit 2, Johnny Five, the robot, gets injured and he's running out of time where his backup battery. And I've never seen my son as stressed <laughs> oh, as that moment boy. of watching whether Johnny Five. And I'm like, man, if you can't handle Johnny Five running out of battery power, I don't think I can let you watch Iron Man or any of these movies because I yeah. feel like he'll be too stressed. I can um, see that. I- there were points. My, my son had points like that in those movies. But overall, right. it was good. All right. All right. I'll, I'll get there uh, pretty soon. Uh, number two, what's one rule change that you would implement in every fantasy league if you could? You know, it it would either be something I gosh, it depends on how general of a scale you're going, but it would probably be I prefer balanced scoring, I prefer super flex, and I prefer fab bidding. Um, I think those are the ones I would I would absolutely get into almost all leagues. Um mm-hmm. I'd I could go really deep and specific, but I think I think just basically most leagues don't do a lot of those. So uh it would be those. You gave me three. I asked for one. That's definitely correct. So I'll mark that one correct. <laughs> Number three, I have a friend whose last name is Fisher. Okay? okay. And he says that everybody who he knows calls him Fish. He yep. doesn't call him by his first name. And he actually preferred that. What percent of people call you Fish? And do your son's friends call him just Fish yet? Or does he they go by his first name? Son's friends do not call him just Fish yet. Um, this is a crazy story. But my son's name is Ian Fish. And okay. in his school, a grade above him is a kid named Ian Fisher, which is just, it's beyond crazy to me that that exists. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what percentage of people call me fish? I'd yep. say it's got to be 40 to 50%. Yeah. It's, right. It's, yeah. It, it's yeah. got to be. That's what he says. He says everybody just gravitates toward him. They almost mean him to be like, hey, I'm just going to call you fish. Is that all right? And he says, yeah, all right. That's fine. Uh, correct answer, by the way, obviously. Uh Number four. All right. This isn't one of the questions. What's your favorite food, Scott? Not one of the questions, but what is your favorite food? <laughs> you don't pro- have to think about it too much. It's, it's probably pepperoni pizza. Okay. So you live in Minnesota. Yep. You are used to the cold. I live in New Hampshire. You and I at one point have had some fun back and forth about oh, yeah. which is colder. Um, if you <laughs> could earn cold. a lifetime supply of free pepperoni pizza from your favorite spot. Okay. okay. A lifetime supply for free. What's the coldest temperature you would be willing to stand outside for five minutes in just a t-shirt and shorts to earn that. Five minutes? Five minutes, t-shirt and shorts. Okay. so I've Lifetime done, supply of pizza. I've done below zero for, I think it was 17 minutes once. What? Um, yeah. What? So the, for five minutes, I'm going to go, I'm going to say just shorts and a t-shirt. I'm going to say 20 below for five minutes. It depends on the wind too. That like is if, very true. If there's if there's no wind, that 20 below feels a little bit better, and I could probably do it for five minutes. So of all the valuable things that you have said on this, I think that was the most valuable because you're absolutely right. It's not the temperature. It's really the wind. When it's yeah. like 25 degrees but windy, it is the worst. If it's Completely zero degrees agree. and no wind, you can live with that, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I would argue – I mean you're dead on. I would argue that the zero degrees with no wind is way more tolerable than the 20 to 25 with wind. All right. I could not agree more. You have taught everybody about weather and cold weather. And 20 (laughs) below is insane, but I will mark it correct because it's aggressive and I love it. Um, I think I saw you tweeting about the show Community a couple of weeks ago. Is that right? Okay. What's your go-to comedy when you need to pick me up? You're feeling down. You're like, man, I just need something to laugh at. What do you go to? (laughs) It's it's still the office. I just play it on repeat uh, a lot of the times when I'm working, and and I know that that that's I don't feel like that's super hot takey, but um, it feels like there are people out there that are very uh, you know <laughs> they they don't like that the office gets so much love, but I I still I still love the office. Who criticizes the office? I mean, the office. There, is there are people classic. out there that are like Parks and Rec is better, Community is okay. better, and and stuff like that, and it, they they. They just don't get the love. My my wife doesn't even get the love. She will not watch The Office with me. Oh my so. goodness! Oh my goodness! That that's tough. Well, uh, I, I I'll be honest. I do like Parks and Recs, 
better than The Office, but it's like one and one A. I think they're both brilliant. Exactly. Those are two of my go-tos. Yeah. Well, definitely, definitely The Office is is certainly a a correct answer because you can't go wrong there. Uh, I unfortunately, because I know you are a Vikings fan, so I I, I don't know. Well, regardless, what's your worst sports memory, Scott? It's it's the ninety eight Gary Anderson kick. Mm -hmm. It it absolutely (laughs) will always be. I remember where I was when it happened. I was uh, in college. Uh, I watched the game with a bunch of people, and when he missed that kick, I walked for what could have been 20 minutes or six hours around campus without saying a single word, just in complete stun shock. Um, I, that that I, I don't know that I'll ever like have a moment like that ever again where I just completely lose track of time and can't speak and can't think, and I'm just like pacing and walking around. I lost track of everything it yeah was terrible i didn't want to ask you it because i assumed that that's what it was going to be but uh that's obviously correct uh i'm <laughs> sorry to, to make you relive it i hope you know don't you know block out the memories if you can. the vikings have a lot of those moments yeah <laughs> I, I get it but that was the one yeah. obviously that i would have figured for, for yeah. someone roughly our age uh yeah. do you bowl scott do you ever bowl i i have bowled and i bowl when we go to like birthday parties and stuff like that but but what's your high score what's your high score in bowling 212 okay you can't be like ah no 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 i never bowl and then what's your score oh i bowled a perfect game once so you know (laughs) i remember it very specifically because i'm like a 130 bowler (laughs) Man, that, <laughs> like, that must have been the best. That's correct. Obviously, I mean, it is your high score. I'm like so. a, a 110 to 130 bowler. <laughs> I'm not it. a great bowler, but I, I remember that one game because I, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I won't forget it. <laughs> I, I'll be honest. My, I, I'm not a particularly athletic human being. I mean, I'm fine, whatever. And the one thing I was in a bowling league growing up, I don't know why, but I was. So I bowled every week for like four years. So I'm a pretty decent bowler. And my favorite thing in the world is when my kids and I go bowling. And when we first started going bowling, because they just thought dad's going to be like mediocre, like he is at everything else. And I was just like busting out 180s. It's pretty much the proudest moment of my oh, life. Man. So. I loved it. That's my go-to. When they're like, what should we do, Dad? I'll be like, bowling, bowling time. Let's do it. But 212 is impressive, especially for a non-regular uh, you know, regular bowler. So. I, I think I've bowled over 150 maybe five times in my life. I'm Doesn't not matter. a good that, bowler. That 212 so. is ingrained in history, and now it's on this podcast. So you're good. That's correct. Uh, what's something that one of your kids does that makes you and your wife say, oh, yeah, he gets that from from me? Like, what is one of the things that either of your kids do that oh, basically wow. was like oh yeah that that's from dad wow i, I can tell you for me one. like for example my daughter she is definitely from my side of the family she has never turned off a light like when she leaves a room ever not one time no matter how many times that we beat it into her she will never turn off a light when she leaves a room and that's like me like i i leave lights on all the time i forget to close drawers i do all sorts of stuff like that that's definitely something that comes from me so do you have anything like that from your kids that come from you for sure well i can tell you neither of my kids got my patience (laughs) so they got they got their patience from their mom i'm okay you're you're not patient no i'm very patient ah they are impatient and they got it from your wife um i would say i would say my my oldest gets my appetite he is That's never good enough. he is always hungry um i'm trying to think of personality traits that but they both seem like really big mixes of us um, okay yeah, that's okay. Hey, appetite is good enough. Appetite I'm gonna get an inco- I'm gonna get an incorrect answer on this one because I can't think of anything that's like starkly one of us. I tell you what, I just I like you so much, and you had something that I was gonna give you, but if you're basically offering an incorrect answer, I'll do it just so you can't sweep because nobody <laughs> sweeps, Scott. I'll, so I'll mark that one Perfect. then incorrect. That's fine, but uh, Perfect. yeah, you know, at next time you can definitely let me know because uh, we had Sean Corner on last time. He just asked his wife one of the questions he was like i don't know what's the answer to this one and she popped in so oh, if you ask your wife later and you come back <laughs> i'll 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 reassess the score um, i do have one my son my oldest artistic ability i can't my wife and him are incredible artists like drawers they can draw so well and they're so creative and i have no artistic talent at all so but, so that's stuff that goes to your wife right yes that's not to you uh, yeah oh right. yeah oh yeah. yeah that's that's no, i get it yeah. No, it's funny because I don't know about you. I mean, your kids are both mixes. My kids are like diametrically opposite. Like my <laughs> son is my wife, is my wife, and my daughter <laughs> is me. It is it is hilarious. But uh, all right, what was your best ever vacation? Number nine, what was your best ever vacation? Oh, boy. 
Um, I'm not going to hold you to it. I don't know every vacation that you went to, so don't stress too much. Just think no, of a nice vacation that you went it's, on. It's got to be either a Disney cruise we went on or the Disney trip we went on, and it's because of my kid. You know, like I I remember going to Scotland and France, and and that that would probably be it without my kid because. I'm I'm I have a lot of Scottish in me. I'm I'm very Scottish, and we went and toured brewer or uh, distilleries and uh, went all over Scotland. Saw where my ancestors came from, and, and got to you know where where my clan's kilt and stuff. And awesome. Uh, uh, my wife lived in France for a while. She's fluent, and so we were we were uh, we spent time there. So that's probably my favorite without kids, and then Disney with my kids is just it's amazing to watch the excitement on their on their face so i'm giving you two like a, a single before kids and a a post kids one considering that i think on behalf of all parents we can agree that you basically have two separate lives you have before kids yeah. life and after kids life we'll mark that correct because that that's true and yes there is i mean it's it's cliche for lack of a better way to say it but going to disney with your kids is the best trip because they is. just just to watch them and, exactly and see them. yep it's too good. All right. Last question. That was correct, by the way. Last question here, Scott. Uh, I ask everybody of this now because I asked it one time and people liked it. So this is a tough one, though. It makes you think a little bit. Uh, if your, God forbid, your house was on fire or you were a secret agent and you've been discovered and you've got to leave, right? Mm -hmm. You can only take one inanimate object. Or obviously your, your family is safe. Everybody's safe. But you could only take one inanimate object from your house. What's the one thing that you're taking? Gosh, and yeah, I'm assuming phone or computer don't count, right? I mean, what well, I think that's probably obvious. Yeah, all right. Let, let's something besides the phone and computer. You're right. Yeah, that's good. Your wife took those already because she's way ahead of the game. She was like, I have this in my briefcase ready to go just in case. And, so she's and together. I'm still going to be with my family. So I you don't got need your it. family. Absolutely. Oh, so I don't so need, you can like... take something from your son. Like if your son, like my, my son is obsessed with this little stuffed animal cow to the okay. point where if he got lost, like I'd be like... I mean that's gotta that's gotta overtake everything else I've got right now. That would probably be my choice. I'll be honest. So anything you want in your house, you've got your phone, you've got your computer, your family safe. Man, this is really tough for me because I'm not a like material object guy, other than like my phone and my computer. Like I can't I can't think of much with sentimental value that. Uh... No, nope, I think you got me. Because I think this oh. is incorrect because I can't think of a single thing in this house. Maybe. You know what? It's, all right. it's probably my my son's my son's uh things that he sleeps with. His his yeah. little his little dodo thing that he's, he calls it dodo that he sleeps It's good with. enough, man. It's probably going to be that so that he can sleep okay and you know he'll that he'll be he'll be okay without the rest of the stuff in our house. I huh. I don't need anything. I'm sure my wife doesn't need anything. I'll I'll get that for the kids so that he can have his, you know, safety thing. I mean, my son has like crazy lightsabers and elaborate Lego sets and favorite games. Nah, man, get him that cow. And that cow is all he will need in life because he sleeps with it every night. I take a picture of him like every night when I go in to check on him. He's cuddled with that cow right up in there. That's my choice, too. So saving your son's thing that he can sleep with. That's correct. Yeah, don't mm -hmm. worry about it. You could have said nothing. Justin Boone said nothing. He said he's got absolutely nothing that he can think of. Um, so you could have gotten nothing, but I like that you dug deep there. Yeah, I and think got that one. personally, it's nothing, but it's, yeah, I mean, course. I suppose that's personal though, because I'm, I'm very much a family oriented guy. So something Absolutely. to make sure my kid is happy is, uh -huh. is, is definitely something I would do. A hundred percent. Cow, who is aptly named cow by my <laughs> son, uh, would be my choice as well. So I'll mark so that correct. Yours gets a real, like my son has a giant dinosaur toy that he named hamburger. <laughs> so oh. my kid. daughter has a smaller dinosaur toy that she named Penty. And for the life of us, still to this day, we do not know where Penty came from. We don't, I mean, we know where that, that actual stuffed animal came from. We don't know where that name came from. Yeah. We've never heard of Penty. We've gone through every show she's ever watched. We've never heard that name, but it is Penty. And Penty is a big one as well. So Penty would be on the Penty or cow. Yeah, my son, no, he's just like, that's cow, that's bear. That's something like that. That's how he <laughs> nice. rolls. I don't know. He's a literal kid. Uh, anyway, all right, Scott, you got nine right. That's an excellent score. You did well. Um, again, remind everybody, it was great having you on. Just remind everybody where they can find you and, and everything you do. 
Sure. Uh, Scott Fish 24 on, on the Twitters and the Instagrams. You can, you can follow me on either of those. Uh, my real day job is uh, Safe Leagues. So safeleagues.com, safeleagues.ffl.com, whatever. You can find links to that on my Twitter or whatever. But um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the business I run. It's a commissioner service. I run Fantasy Leagues. So uh, it's a nice, safe, fun community uh, for Fantasy Leagues. And uh, scottfishbowl.com is where you can sign up to play this year, not really a good chance to get, get it anymore. <laughs> it's basically full, but uh, you can sign up for next year soon and, uh, you know, follow along with that. Fantasycares.net is is the fantasy stuff. Um, this year, I kind of challenged the industry to, I know that we are going to do the pot and the t-shirt sales with Rotoware and uh, John Bosch's Eliminators was all going to raise money for toys. So this year, instead of taking donations on Fantasy Cares, I ch- I challenge the industry and people who, you know, follow me to donate. There's a lot going on in the world right now. And there's, you know, pe- a lot of people in places that need help. I-, I challenged people, donate to what you're most passionate about. Find something you're passionate about and go donate to that. So I didn't I didn't open Fantasy Cares donations this year. You you can donate, you can give money via the Potathon or or t-shirts or John Bosch's Eliminators. A couple of those might be done by the time you hear this. But uh, mostly just go out there and, and donate to, to something that you're truly passionate about. I'm sure they need help, this, especially this year. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're in a time where anything you can give to charity, really anything that you feel strongly about uh, is warranted. So that's great. Scott, it was really great having you on. I'm glad we can make it work. I know we had a couple of scheduling yeah. issues here early in the day, but uh, I'm glad. Mostly we were my fault. It. Yeah, <laughs> it's no, all my worry. fault. <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, good luck for the next, uh, you know, couple of weeks until the fishbowl starts uh, hammering out all those loose ends. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Dan. Yeah. All right. I want to remind everybody uh, about the giveaway that we're doing with the signed Devonta Adams helmet. Again, it runs for a couple more days. So go ahead and leave an honest review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Send a screenshot of that review to gamechangers at fantasypros.com. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>